Akinori Abo, is a carpenter known for his top-level carpentry skills specializing in constructing houses and furniture using natural materials and skilled handwork. Now, his ultra-thin hand plane shavings of only 3 micrometers thickness will be demonstrated. The plane blade is protruding a little too far out on the left-hand side. It's not excessively uneven. In terms of microns, if the thickness here is 10 microns, it would be around 13 microns on this side. Through experience, you can tell how many microns the plane blade is protruding when adjusting the blade. One pass and you have a rough idea of its micron thickness. The blade protrusion should always be equal on both sides of the plane. However, the condition of the plane's body or the wood surface can cause one side of the blade to protrude more. So minor adjustments are necessary. All work takes some getting used to, right? I often make tables about 90 centimeters wide and 180 centimeters long. In making these, there's almost no surface unevenness along its length. But if you place a ruler along its width, you'll see that the surface waves up and down a fair bit. To make it smooth and flat at the micron scale, you must be adept at hand planing thin shavings. Using a hand plane of this width, you cannot plane an entire pillar's width in one pass, it's necessary to plane it in two or three passes. If you sharpen a wide plane blade's cutting edge straight, you can flatten a 120 mm width in one pass. However, when using a sunpachi sized plane with a blade width of about 72 mm, you'll need to plane it in two passes. This can create bumps or produce a slanted surface. To minimize such irregularities, I need to plane as thinly as possible. Doing so still produces little bumps on the surface, but because they are so fine, one or two microns, you can hardly feel them when you touch the surface by hand. However, if the plane shavings are too thick, say 50 or 100 microns, any surface irregularities will be clearly apparent, and it'll look messy. This is why being adept at hand planing thin shavings is a highly crucial skill. Even once you've mastered these skills, if craftspeople gather from all over Japan, there'll invariably be people with a much higher skill level. What's my philosophy in my day-to-day -day work? The craftsperson in me definitely wouldn't want to lose to anyone else if people were to gather and compete. So I compete against imaginary rivals every single day. It would be incredibly frustrating if I didn't have the skills to match. This is what being a craftsperson is all about. The blunt of the blade, the more pressure is required for planing. But when it's sharp, it's enough to gently place your hand. Planing with the weight of your hand and the plane alone. As the blade becomes blunt, it doesn't bite into the wood, so I have to use a lot of pressure. At the moment, this blade is very sharp, so I can plane just by gently pulling the body. While I'm planing, I check that the plane's body is centered on the material being planed, that it's not shifting left or right, and that the shavings aren't broken. It becomes noisy when you plane against the grain direction. You can get tear out, a situation in which the wood grain tears ahead of the plane blade, leaving the surface rough and gouged. It will start to make coarse, abrasive sounds. So. When I feel the surface become coarse and abrasive, I slow down and plane very slowly. I can minimize tear out simply by reducing my speed. My plane's body is about 3 or 4 millimeters shorter in depth than standard planes. 
This makes it easier to hear the sound of the wood being planed and feel changes in texture through my hand. The thicker it is, the harder it becomes to feel those changes through your palm. However, if the plane's body were even thinner, it would warp as it ages, becoming difficult to use. One of the causes of tear out is how fast you pull the plane. Another is how well the plane blade is sharpened. Even if you use the same plane with the same blade protrusion, there are instances where tear out will and won't occur. I work through these issues by being mindful of the type of grain the blade is passing and listening to the sound the blade makes. There are several ways to stop tear out. The first is to have a sharp blade. The second is to reduce the mouth size. The mouth refers to where the plain blade protrudes out from the sole, the underside of the body. The width of the mouth opening should be around 40 microns, which is about the thickness of an average human hair. This way, the blade's tip will be close to where the body presses down on the material, minimizing the possibility the blade will dig into and split the wood grain. The cutting edge can lift and tear the wood grain on the surface away from the rest of the wood, rather than evenly shaving the surface. The best way to avoid tear out is to decrease the mouth opening. You'll begin to see tear out with a mouth opening of approximately 1 mm. If that happens, one thing you can do is pull the plane slowly. And secondly, this here is called chip breaker. If you position its blade tip a hair, about 40 microns, away from the primary blade's tip and pull slowly. The main blade is sharpened at 28 degrees, and the chip breaker at around 22 to 23 degrees. So, using the blades together increases the bevel angle, making it more difficult for the blade to easily split the wood. Therefore, increasing the bevel angle is another way to prevent tear out. However, this is merely a countermeasure, and the most fundamental way to stop tear out is by reducing the size of the mouth opening. If you ensure the mouth opening is only around 40 microns, this will dramatically reduce tear out. My work is a constant battle in reducing the mouth size. From this angle, you can barely see the mouth opening. However, when you look at it from this angle, you can see the light coming through from the other side. That's why to make the mouth opening as small as possible, we tend to use the light. This is Yoshino Hanoki Cypress, 120 mm. This plane has a blade width of 174 mm, so there's some excess blade width on either side. Even this has a thickness of around 13 microns. Shall we measure it? See, it's 13. I just happened to get a thin shaving before. 12. 10. This one's uneven. 9. I use this plane for members fitted off internal measurements, such as thresholds, head jams, and door frames as you always get a cleaner finish by planing in one pass rather than two. This plane isn't too difficult to use. It's about twice the size of a standard Sunpachi sized, 72 mm wide, plane, but sharpening it isn't too complicated. I use it for thresholds, head jams, or framing members. Even with such members, if it's wider than 180 mm, you can't plane it in a single pass. However, this will work for larger posts of about 120 millimeters. 
I can plane the surface in a single pass, so it'll produce an immaculate finish. Generally, in a poorly set up plane, the blade is not held correctly by the blade slot. Instead, it relies on the pressure from the narrow upper surface of the blade slot here and the bed underneath becoming prone to wear. In addition, with a poorly set up body, you have to hit the blade's head quite hard from the beginning to force it in until it goes all the way in. I prefer not to set up my planes that way, so I set them up so that the plane blade fits perfectly within the blade slot. I make it so that the tip stops about one millimeter short of the mouth when I first insert the blade. From that point, I make the slots tighter, meaning that I can adjust the blade protrusion for the final millimeter or so by lightly tapping the blade's head. I've made hundreds of plain bodies in the past. I'm used to making them, so it's part of my routine to work on them in the morning and evening when I have some spare time. I've made the bodies for all of the planes here. Preparing them myself makes them fit for purpose. Here are some of the plain bodies I've been working on recently. They're all roughly cut and carved like so, then left to rest. When wood is cut, exposing the end grain, it starts drying out from there. So from here too, and here. After producing the laminated wood, I finish the rough cutting as soon as possible and let it sit to dry for several months. After it has stopped warping from losing moisture content, I process the edges again, making a plain body. The plain blade's thickness is always tapered. It's thicker here and thinner here. Before carving into the body, I measure the taper of the blade, like so. To cut this, I use an Aussie beaky, a special handsaw used for cutting the blade slots within the plain body. There aren't many good ones around. And I've used many to this day, but this one saws very well. The teeth are neither crosscut nor rip, and it saws Japanese kashi oak very well. A good saw will be able to leave half of the marking lines intact. If you use a pencil, the lines will be around 30 microns thick. If you can obtain a good saw that can cut accurately, it will leave you with perfect conditions to carve the bed, the surface on which the blade's back will rest. I take my time and carve this little by little to prevent it from becoming too loose. When using a chisel to cut an area neatly to a uniform depth, there's a chance the chisel will cut too deep, loosening the fit. You have to be careful not to do this. However, when using the chisel, you can't see where the tip is aiming, so it's pretty standard for things not to work out when you're a beginner. As you get used to it, you get much better at fine-tuning this, so you can place your preliminary cuts ensuring not go too deep. If you strike a blade that has too tight a fit, in areas like this, the wood might split, here too. Although it can't be so tight that the wood splits, it must be tight enough to secure the blade. You need to build experience to get this just right. If you apply a ruler against this surface, you can tell it isn't flat. Instead, it's slightly rippled. If it's severely uneven, I sand it flat. Whether the blade tip will protrude 3 microns when struck, won't protrude at all, or will only protrude when struck very hard. Or whether you're trying to make it recede a little, and it unintentionally recedes very far. How the blade connects with the bed and the blade slot. On this surface here, determines these things. I only carve the plane's bed once I've checked that there's no gap here, 
no matter how you look at it. No matter how hard the wood is to work with, whether it's hard or burly, if you do all of this, and so long as the plane has a small mouth opening, that's why this part of the blade slot is so important. And here, Also, drawing an arc like this, this area should fit firmly against the blade. It's not a matter of making this entire surface touch the blade, this area here needs some space. If this area were also to fit firm, there'd be more chance that the blade's tip would move around. There should be a gap of approximately 20 microns. A hair is about 40 microns, so that should be fine. It's not a simple matter of ensuring there are no gaps. You must consider which areas need to be in contact, are touching, and which areas require gaps. This area is called a kazudamari, where the plane shavings collect. It doesn't matter if this is further back or forward. So long as the plane shavings come out neatly, in store-bought products, the Kazudamari slants back from this point. The crucial area is here, around the mouth. In this plane, it's at a right angle and sturdy. In store-bought products, it angles back like this and becomes very thin and flimsy. Even though this is a crucial area that should be sturdy and stable, this is why I've made it a little narrower. Various types of Hagane steel are used for plain blades, including Ogami steel, Shogami steel, or imported Swedish steel. Still, the most crucial part of a plane is the body and its preparation. 80 or 90% is in the setting up of the body and conditioning of the soul. So long as the blade is made from iron laminated with high carbon Hagane steel, the plane will generally shave fine. As for the sole, to give it stability, I flattened one centimeter of the sole here, as well as about one centimeter here, towards the end of the body. If you want to make it more stable, two centimeters would be fine also. These other areas should generally be made a hair's thickness lower. The flat areas towards the end and near the mouth must be parallel. If they aren't parallel, it'll be unstable, and the plain shavings will break. However, if the flattened areas near the blade and towards the end of the body are perfectly parallel, plus you take 30 to 40 microns off the area in between, the plane will work very well. The body of my plane is slightly longer than is standard. This one is about 38.8 centimeters long. Whereas a standard plane body is about 30 centimeters long. Simply by extending it 9 centimeters, you get a stunningly straight surface. Standard planes are 30 centimeters or slightly shorter. In the past, they would have been 9 sun long, or around 27 centimeters. But these days planes are becoming longer and longer. Even though the body has become longer, wood materials have become flatter and no longer pose a problem for planing. Apparently, back in the day, some materials had to be scraped sideways with Sotomaru Kana, a plane with a convex-shaped sole, before being ready for planing. Nowadays, wood is sawn using machines, so in comparison, the plane's body is becoming longer and longer. In my case, whether I'm making tables or other items, I want them to be well made and accurate, so I make the bodies 9 centimeters longer than what is standard. This way, my plane is very stable as I use it. 
because my plane is closer to the length of a Nagadai Kana, a long smoothing plane, everyone asks, isn't it difficult to handle? Or, they say, but it must be tricky to condition the sole of the plane. But this isn't the case, and once you become used to the length, it's hard to use anything else. When it's short, it's impossible to get a flat surface because the plane follows the surface too closely. That's why I've settled on this length for now. If you want to condition the sole, you need to use a tachi kana or scraping plane, also called a denaushi kana, a sole conditioning plane. This type of plane has a perpendicular blade. A standard version would look like this and be shorter towards the end. I'm not too fond of that, so I make all these planes myself to ensure the scraping plane is very stable. I prefer that the body of the scraping plane can rest entirely on the sole you are conditioning, even when the blade is clear of the sole, like so. I adjust the blade protrusion to control the coarseness required for the area around the mouth, the area towards the end, and roughly take off the middle. I use only a small amount of blade protrusion for the most finely tuned section here. For the rest, the blade protrusion can be increased. However, planing across the grain can produce a rough finish. So, you use this one to plane even thinner shavings for the final finish. I have many of these scraping planes tuned for the preliminary planing to the finishing stage, but it's uncommon to have this many. Most people only have one scraping plane to finish all of these areas, so the finish can become very rough. It's also important to condition the sole of the scraping plane itself. If you don't frequently flatten the scraping plane's sole, no matter how hard you try, you won't be able to flatten the soles of your other planes. This has already been made flat. It is completely flat other than the blade, which might protrude 2 microns. Unlike ordinary planes, if the blade is retracted, the body will change shape, so you must have the blade protruding while you condition its sole. Otherwise, it might distort inwards or outwards, so you'll never be able to plane a flat surface. That's why in the case of the scraping plane, the sole must be completely flat. That will often change, so I have to condition its sole frequently. Conditioning this sole is more complicated. Unless you're careful, making the entire surface flat is a challenge, it's tricky. The body currently has this thickness but will become thinner through use. As that happens, you'd think the blade would constantly protrude. However, the blade is tapered so that the fit becomes tighter as the blade is sharpened. The relationship between the thinning body and the blade's taper is very well considered. The tapered blade becomes tighter and tighter as you sharpen it. The blade won't go as far in but the body's thickness will also decrease, making the blade slot shorter. It is said that for every plane blade, you will go through 5 to 10 bodies. This is because it has to be replaced when the mouth widens too much. However, I'm not too fond of this, so when the mouth becomes too big, I laminate another 3 or 4 mm thick piece over the sole. That way, I don't have to carve everything from scratch, and it also decreases the mouth size. I've laminated several pieces onto here. I frequently check the bevel using an angle protractor like this, this one happens to be 28 degrees right now. When I'm drowning in work, I tend to sharpen the blade more upright, and the bevel can become more obtuse, so I need to make frequent adjustments. 
I also have to be careful that the beveled tip remains perpendicular to the blade. Check that the sides are even relative to the sole, and check which areas require more sharpening. I check these things when I remove the blade, sharpening each area as needed. I check the bevel using the protractor to determine whether the angle is too obtuse and needs to be reduced or too sharp and needs to be increased, I rely quite a bit on the protractor. If you place the chip breaker too far towards the tip, you will have a situation in which plain shavings will enter here, between the main blade and the chip breaker, and come out the other end. You would think that the more pressure you apply on the chip breaker, the more the two blade tips will firmly meet. But in fact, the more you press down, the more the tip of the chip breaker will lift. In this case, the area about 1 or 2 millimeters from the end will adhere, but the tip will lift as it's very thin. The plain shavings will enter from in between and come out from between the two blades here. So then, you think, oh, plain shavings must be coming out here because the fit is loose, striking down these bent edges further to make it tighter. However, the tighter you make it, the more likely plain shavings will enter here. The blade should stop about one millimeter away from the sole to prevent this when inserted. When inserting the chip breaker, the fit should be loose enough that it almost reaches the blade tip. Otherwise, you might get plain shavings entering between the two blades. In summary, you should not set up the chip breaker to have an extremely tight fit, the gentler the fit, the better. To avoid tear out, you want to push the chip breaker as close to the tip of the blade as possible, so in my case, I set it 40 microns away from the blade tip. If you push it out further, the plane surface loses luster, and it becomes difficult to pull the plane. The blade of my chip breaker has a 22 degree bevel and isn't stepped. All standard store-bought chip breakers have a stepped bevel. Many carpenters sharpen it to have a stepped bevel, believing it's the proper way to sharpen it. However, I never do that, I sharpen the bevel to about 22 degrees, straight and sharp, just like the main blade. 